My name is Jessica. Likewise, I'm a BCBA. I've been in the field 14 years. I just sat for my exam in September because I'm so OG. When I was living in New York, where I was working, I was grandfathered in under an old license. I relocated and had to take my exam. And now I help you study for your exams because I know how hard it is to do that later in life. The whiny puppy you hear in the background that is lucky, he will probably make his presence known. He does in all of my videos. His favorite time to talk is when I am recording things. That's his favorite time to talk. I do wanna go over some brief housekeeping for today. Um, the first thing I just wanna go over, not everyone knows about my Facebook group. Everyone messages me, how do I find out about your events? The best way to, do to, to, to find out about my events is just to go into my BCBA exam prep group I'm gonna take that link and drop it in the chat right now. If you are watching this on YouTube, I will put the links in the link to that in the comments of the video. I post in there um, pretty much every day, either whatever videos I'm posting on YouTube, whatever information about my events, the webinars, um, blog posts, that's the best way to be um, aware of what I'm doing and what I'm, what's happening with what I'm doing. So I do want to just quickly, before we go into the presentation tonight, to share with you guys, I am doing a G intensive workshop. Um, it's listed as a seven hour workshop. There will be a break for lunch. So six hours will probably wind up going over. I'm writing the content. I think it's going to be a lot longer than that. I do apologize about my dog in the background. So this is a full all day event that will be taking place this Saturday. It is the most intensive um, look at G that you will find. There's no course available or no, um, no group available that they're going this far into G. So if you're struggling with G, it's the biggest part of the task list. You will not struggle with it after my intensive. Now, if you're watching this now live, it, the next event is this Saturday. I also do have a $10 coupon code that you can use to save 10, S-A-V-E 10. That'll take $10 off. Um, and if you're watching this in record mode, you're watching this on YouTube. The date might not be next Saturday, but I will be doing this event regularly. So you can still check out my website, hopeeducationservices.com. If you're interested in it, go under the store, BCBA exam prep, go to the G intensive. I also do an experimental de design intensive. So both of those events are hosted regularly. So if you missed either one of them, you can attend either one of them. And that code save 10 will work for both of those now and uh, at least for now. So you can check that out. I do want to jump in right to our content tonight to be respectful of your time. So what I'm going to be doing is going over five mock questions. So if you're watching this live, I'm going to give you some time to be able to answer the questions. Um, and if you're watching and recording, I'm going to have you pause after I ask the question because I'm going to take that lag time out. And then you can just press play to hear the answer and the explanation. And we're going to go through five questions today about um, conditioned motivating operations. I'm just going to ask everybody who is currently um, not muted if you guys can mute yourself because I am getting some background noise. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to read question one. I do always read the questions and the answers out loud because I do know that a lot of people who do like to study with these videos are multitasking, right? Maybe you're watching this in record mode and you're cleaning your house. I totally get that. I did the same thing when I was studying. So I want to make it easy for you to be able to um, get all the content. If you're here live, make sure that when you send me your answers, you send it to me privately. So that way um, there's no reactivity in the group. So just send me a private message in the chat. All right, question one. Cynthia just got a small puppy Elmo. Her house has no backyard, so she got him an electric fence. She felt bad using it with Elmo, but knows that he is likely to learn when it will shock him and does not and will not get shocked often. The cashier at the pet store assured Cynthia it won't hurt him. And even if it does, the first time Cynthia put the collar on Elmo, Elmo took off towards the perimeter of the electric fence. The collar beeped 10 times and then shocked Elmo. Elmo ran back to Cynthia. That was the only time Elmo ever got shocked by the collar. After the first time, Elmo ran back towards the house whenever he heard the collar beep. What MO does this depict? A, unconditioned motivating operation. 
B, transitive motivating operation. C, surrogate motivating operation. And D, reflexive motivating operation. So I'm going to give everybody who is here live a minute to answer. Um, just throw your answer, like I said, privately in the chat. So here your answer is going to be D, a reflexive motivating operation. Now, I actually spent a significant amount of time today doing a deep dive into reflexive motivating operation in Cooper because I have seen different BCBAs teach reflexive motivating operation differently. So I wanted to go directly to the source and really under get a really clear picture for you guys of what a reflexive motivating operation is. So reflexive motivating operation is often seen as a signal, right, that a condition's about to change. That's what people typically teach it as. It is specifically just a warning signal. It, it cannot be used for a situation improving. It is specifically indicating that something bad is about to happen. And what it does is it creates an MO for discriminated avoidance. And that's what it essentially what reflexive motivating operation is doing. It is a warning that if you do not engage in a particular behavior, something bad will happen. So example of that is let's say when the sky starts getting dark and you decide you're gonna, maybe you're playing, you're on the beach, right? Or you're playing soccer in the park and you see the sky is getting dark. That is a reflexive motivating operation for the fact that you want to escape, right? So it is essentially creating a motivation for escape. So it's not, and, and I was a little bit confused myself before doing this deep dive today into this topic, because I always thought, okay, well, if it's warning you that a situation is going to be bad, why would it be creating an ML, right? Because it wouldn't then be just signaling something. But what it's signaling for is it's creating the MO for that, that it's not escape because you're not in the condition yet, but discriminated avoidance. The idea that something is going to happen and you want that thing to not happen. So you're going to create an MO for the escape behavior. So here, the beeping sound, right? The beeping happens prior to the dog getting shocked. And so when he hears the beeping, that's when he would be running away. They were running back towards the house in order to avoid getting shocked because he knows the beeping is indicating that there's a way in which he's going to avoid the shock. Now, people have often said two things. There's two things that people get confused about. Well, why isn't an it then an SD? The beeping is not signaling that the reinforcement is available. It's just creating the MO for the behavior. So it's creating the motivation to engage in escape but it's not actually signaling that escape is available because let's say it's beeping and it's saying that it's about to shock, but for some reason, the dog has gone too far away that he can't get back into the fenced in area. Or let's say that the dog maybe is in a car and the parent forgot to put the um, collar, right? Took the, take the collar off the dog. And so the dog gets shocked when the person drives away. So it's not signaling that reinforcement is available. It's just, creating a desire to, to engage in that discriminated avoidance. Now, in the chat, someone's asking, why is it not paired? Because wouldn't the have shocking have been the, wouldn't the beeping have been paired with the shock? Remember that all unconditioned or all conditioned and motivating operations, so transitive, surrogate, and reflexive are all conditioned and motivating operations, which means at one point they would have had to be paired in order to create that relationship. Right? So the first time that the dog heard that beeping and then got shocked, yes, it did get paired with the, with the beeping. That's what made it, um, that's what conditioned it as a reflexive motivating operation. But with the surrogate motivating operation, that's going to be, and then that's where the pairing comes in. And I'm kind of giving it away for another answer. But that makes you want something as opposed to want to engage in discriminated avoidance. So that's essentially what ref reflexing motivating operation is. It is when you have a warning that you want to engage in escape behavior before something bad happens. All right, so any questions that reflects a motivating operation? Some of my coaching students had asked me um, in the past that they had been taught from another BCBA that it could signal a, be um, a behavior or condition improving, it can't. So I just wanted to clarify, I did a deep dive into that today. 
And I myself didn't fully understand how it could even be a motivating operation. But again, just to make it super, super clear, what the reflexive mo doing it, the motivating operation is for discriminated avoidance. And that comes straight from Cooper. It's a good question too. Wendy was cleaning up some drawers in her house. In one of the drawers, she found a ticket stub from the first date she had with her boyfriend. After seeing the ticket stub, she called him and asked if they could do a dinner and a movie that Friday night. What type of MO does this depict? A, unconditioned motivating operation, B, transitive motivating operation, C, surrogate motivating operation, and D, reflexive motivating operation. All right, guys, so everyone got this. This is a surrogate motivating operation. So a surrogate motivating operation is when something gets paired with the desirable thing that you want. And when you see that thing that got paired with it, you want the thing you really want. So essentially here, she sees this ticket sub, right? And she got the ticket stub the last time she was on, a, or on when she was on her first date with her boyfriend. Now, we would assume that she had a positive experience because she's still dating him and she wants to go back to the movies with him. So then when she sees this ticket stub, she doesn't want the ticket stub, but she wants the ticket, the thing that the ticket stub made her remember that she enjoyed, which was the movies. So it made her want to go to the movies. So that's a surrogate motivating operation. So another example could be a menu, right? A takeout menu. So let's say you're, you know, cleaning up the house, you see a takeout menu. And then you don't want the takeout menu, but the takeout menu may make you want pizza. And you don't really need, you could argue you need the takeout menu to get pizza, but you don't, right? You can, you can call and get a pizza without the takeout menu. So, you know, essentially maybe it makes you want pizza. And so you, when you see the menu, you associate it with pizza. So you want pizza. Um, or maybe you see your coffee mug, you're like, you're doing dishes and you have a coffee mug and that coffee mug makes you want a latte, but you didn't want it before you saw the, the mug. But the, when you saw the mug, it made you want the latte. So that is essentially, um, yeah, what a surrogate motivating operation is. And someone says, yeah, it could be a tool. They needed the ticket stub to get into the movies. That's right. That would be a tool, which would be a transitive motivating operation which we'll go over that in another question. So any questions about a surrogate motivating operation? And again, guys, remember, all of these things were, are paired, right? All conditioned reinforcers are paired. So at one point, this neutral object, like a ticket stub is right neutral, it's a piece of paper. If you found a random ticket stub on the ground, it would be totally neutral. It was paired with a positive experience. And now when you see the ticket stub, it reminds you of the positive experience and makes you want that positive experience again. And that's what makes it a surrogate motivating operation. So this is an example of a transitive motivating operation. The point is that she needed a credit in order to get the audiobook. So the credit became a tool to get the audiobook, just like a key is a tool to open your mailbox, you know, or whatever it is, if you need your phone, you would want a phone charger, that's your key to get the phone if your phone is dead, right? It's a tool. So she didn't want one credit, she wanted a book, but to get the book, she needed one credit. That's the definition of a transitive motivating operation. A transitive motivating operation tends to be the easiest to remember because T is the same for tool, and it's essentially a tool you need to get the thing you really want. So it's essentially when you have this thing, you need this thing to get what you really want. So you want the thing you need, but you don't really want that thing, right? So if I was, you know, and this is a true story for me. So I listen to Audible and I have like, I pay for that membership library and I have like 500 books like pending in my library that I want to listen to. But I did recently fall in love with this new novel series and I really, really wanted to listen to the next book in the series. And so I ran out of, I don't have any credits. I only get one per month and I use the one from last month to get the credit, but I really wanted the next book. Now I really didn't want one credit. I don't care about the credit sitting in my card, but I needed the credit in order to be able to listen to the book. So I went and I purchased the credit and then I used that credit to get the book. The book was the thing I really wanted. It wasn't the credit that I really wanted. So that's what makes it a transitive motivating operation. 
Is that clear? Because I know some people in the, in the chat said they didn't really understand it. Good. Okay, perfect. All right, question four. Delilah is teaching her students to identify colors, or her student to identify colors. She is using raisins to reinforce correct response. Which type of MO does this depict? A, unconditioned motivating operation. B, transitive motivating operation. C, surrogate motivating operation. Or D, reflexive motivating operation. I see a lot of people are saying they're not a fan of raisins. I'm not a big fan of raisins either. Um, but if I was dying on a deserted island, I would eat them because... And I'll jump right into the explanation because my body naturally wants food, right? Food is a primary reinforcer. It is an unconditioned motivating operation. That's what's being depicted here. All right, sorry guys, I had muted myself for a second while my dog was barking. I had promised he would make himself known in, my, um, in our meeting and he didn't disappoint. So the whole point here is that Delilah is being reinforced by the reasons, right? So the re it's, it's a primary reinforcer. All um, access to reinforcement is controlled by MOs, by motivating operations. So in the event that she's using a raisin to have a reinforcer, it means that Delilah must have an MO for the raisin, meaning she wants the raisin. Um, if this is, an, this, is not an, uh, this is not any of the conditioned MOs, this is an unconditioned motivating operation. Because at the end of the day, there's only a few things that our body is born wanting. And food is one of them. I will not tell you the rest of them because that is in the next question. So which of these is not an unconditioned motivating operation or does not, we do not, and really I should phrase this as which of these do we not have an unconditioned motivating, excuse me, motivating operation for? They're all unconditioned reinforcers. But if it's an unconditioned reinforcer, and for some people that are saying they're a little confused, if you want something, if it's a reinforcer, there is a motivation, MO and an an MO for it. So if there's a reinforcer, you can assume there's an MO for it. So which of these things do not create an unconditioned motivating operation? All right, I see a pretty even split between C and D, sex and love. Um, so I see if, if everyone was filling out dating profiles that they would, which one of they would say is more important to them. No, I'm just kidding. All right, guys, there are only a few primary reinforcers we only have motivating operations for a few things. And those are going to be food. It's going to be water. It's going to be activity or movement, right? Removal of pain, removal of extreme temperatures of both heat and of um, cold and sex. That's the only thing that our body is biologically wired to crave. We don't learn to crave sex. Our body biologically learns to crave sex. We do not biologically, primarily learn to crave love. So love is not the answer on Valentine's Day. So I guess we're ending on that note. We do not, um, that is the only one that is not an unconditioned motivating operation. And hopefully we do not get an explicit rating because we said sex. Wouldn't surprise me though. All right, guys. So that is it. I'm going to be sending you guys out the recording um, of this. It will also have the answer key and you'll get these, this presentation as well. Like I said, I do have the experimental design, the intensive G workshop. It is an all day event that is taking place Saturday. I am writing the content. It is probably not likely we're going to finish in the, from two to nine. So I may, I originally said an hour lunch break. We might shorten it a little bit and we're probably going to go past nine. So Sorry to my friends on the East Coast, but I'm writing the content and it's very, very in-depth. For those of you who do have the fifth edition task list course I made with Dr. Katie, it is much more in-depth than that. So we're going to have a really, really, really big deep dive into, um, into task list G. So if you have any questions at all about task list G, you will not have any questions when we're done. And again, if you guys want to check that out, you can get that on my website, hopeeducationservices.com and 10 off or save 10, both of them. I think I said the other code earlier, they both will work to take $10 off. Save 10 or 10 off.